Thank you all for coming to this event, arranged by the Danish United Nations Association of Northern Jutland and Aalborg University. And today, as you can see, we are honored to be joined from New York by Mr. Mons Lykketoft. Um, most of you know who Mons Lykketoft is, and most of his, if not all of his resume. But nevertheless, I find it right to, to just briefly state that, that um, Mons Lykketoft, amongst many other things, is the former speaker of the Danish parliament, uh, holder, holder of uh, different ministerial offices, and most importantly for today, he's the current president of the United Nations General Assembly. Um, he'll now give a speech related to today's subject of um, peacekeeping operations. And after that, we will have time to, for moments to answer a couple of questions from the audience, from you. And we'll have a microphone on each side of the audience, so you just uh, raise your hand if you have a question, and a microphone will find you, and you can address Mons Lebetov with a brief question, and uh, he will answer it. So let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Mons Lebetov for joining us today. Thank you for the, uh, for the opening and uh, good morning here from New York. Uh, on UN peacekeeping, you can say, first, uh, the world would have been an even more conflict-torn place if we hadn't had 120,000 people in UN peacekeeping operations around the world. But, but we... we uh, of course, always have a strong focus on what was not done and what was not done uh, in, a, in, in a satisfactory way. What was not done, we all know, has to do uh, with the lack of unity in the Security Council, uh, one of the veto holding or more of the veto holding powers, uh, uh, rejecting the possibility of UN intervention. We have had that problem over Syria now for five years with very, very tragic consequences in loss of lives and uh, uh, half of the population of Syria uprooted during the civil war. Uh, hopefully there is a development now where the UN can play a positive role in a gradual secession of hostilities inside Syria and the start of the political process. But to the ongoing uh, peacekeeping operations, of course, we also face a number of problems. Uh, uh, the most actual one, uh, the uh, uh, problems we have uh, recognized in, in the Central African Republic with uh, sexual harassment and sexual exploitation from, from UN soldiers, which is a, 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 a question actually uh, very much on the agenda, both in the Security Council and uh, later this week uh, in uh, the General Assembly as well. How do we have a more uniform and more disciplined uh, performance of UN peacekeeping operations? Because these, these uh, very grave problems, of course, arise from the fact that we have very, very different cultures of discipline or lack of discipline from the different contributing countries to the UN peacekeeping operations. Uh, third point uh, is about the whole structure of the UN peacekeeping activity as it is organized now and how it could be organized better. Uh, here we will have, we have a number of reports already on on peacekeeping operations, on the peace-building architecture of the United Nations, on the, the uh, women, peace and security, which is very much about the necessity, uh, one, to protect uh, much more efficient women and girls in zones of conflict, uh, uh, which also relates back to the actual case from the Central African Republic. But it's more than that, it's also the necessity of involving women much, much more in the, the peace building activities of the United Nations uh, with the hope that that will uh, help preventing or escalating conflicts. 
Uh, I am, uh, as President of the General Assembly, I will assemble on the 10th and 11th of May uh, a high-level theoretic debate on the peace and security activities of the United Nations. Uh, with uh, the fundament of the different reports for uh, better integrating and performing the peacekeeping and uh, peacebuilding activities, with very much focus on the necessity for the UN to be even stronger in the mediation, the so-called uh, special political missions, which is already a major part of uh, what the UN organization is actually doing, but much more, even much more focus on mediation uh, in order to uh, prevent or contain conflicts at an earlier stage uh, and thereby avoiding the terrible human costs, but also the very huge economic costs by uh, hardcore military interventions to, to, to stop or contain conflicts after they actually broke out. Uh, and we have just now finished a draft of a new resolution on the UN peace building uh, architecture where we have much emphasized on, of course, we need a stronger UN peace building architecture in order to support countries on their way out of conflict. Countries where uh, UN peacekeeping troops are on the way out in order to build strong institutions to avoid relapse into conflict. But that the, 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 the question of peace building architecture is not only uh, in the aftermath of conflicts, it's very much also a part of the uh, early efforts in mediation to avoid uh, countries going into civil wars, conflicts and so on. Uh, and, and for that reason, we need uh, inside the stronger emphasis on mediation also to use the tools of peace building architecture or building stronger national institutions uh, in order to avoid uh, human rights abuses or uh, 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 other factors de de uh, creating uh, a, 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 uh, a way into conflict. So that is very much the uh, focus right now on the whole question of what can the UN do in in peace and security, and I hope that our high-level meeting in May will be an important stepping stone in actually drawing substantial action conclusions on the different reports of how to reform the whole effort of peacekeeping in the UN. Thank you. selection there because uh, the UN is very depending on the willingness of member states to contribute uh, to the peacekeeping operations and uh, uh, it is a problem that uh, some of the poorest and in this connection also maybe less disciplined uh, military uh, establishments uh, in poor states uh, 
are most willing to contribute because they get a revenue for the state, the, the, for the UN contributions to, to, to the to, uh, uh, contributing uh, nation is uh, higher than the wage paid to the soldiers. So it's, uh, it's a good business for some of the poor countries in Africa uh, to contribute with, with, uh, with uh, troops to uh, peacekeeping operations. But it's exactly in some of those countries where we have uh, the worst problems with the discipline also. Uh, and uh, on the other side, we have difficulties getting the richer countries who will certainly not have a revenue out of sending out uh, uh, peacekeeping operation units uh, to contribute sufficiently. I remember a conversation we had many, many years ago when I was foreign minister in Denmark in the European Union uh, Council of Foreign Ministers together with the then UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. It was uh, in 2001 when there was ambitious uh, drafts on the table of a uh, European Union expeditionary force uh, to support peacekeeping. And Kofi Annan said to us at that time, uh, that would, uh, please do this, please do this, uh, because that will be the up till now most important contribution to the efficiency uh, of, of uh, United Nations peacekeeping. Unfortunately, we, we never really uh, did it uh, from the side of Europe. Uh, and, and for that reason, well, we had, of course, French uh, around in Africa, including the Central African Republic, we have uh, French legionnaires uh, taking part uh, of, of, uh, of the uh, actions, but most of the contributions are from, from uh, African countries themselves. We have another question. question. Thank you. Uh, the present uh, Foreign Minister of Denmark, Christian Jensen, has made some proposals in the last days of uh, changing uh, the structure of uh, Danish development aids. Uh, so there wouldn't be uh, this uh, big uh, skip between different parts of uh, the aid, so that uh, uh, <clears throat> peacekeeping, uh, work with the refugees, uh, help to uh, camps around uh, the uh, Syria, Lebanon, etc., and the long-term development aid uh, should be more in the same uh, way of approaching. There should be uh, uh, this different uh, uh, way in different uh, sectors. And I understand a little of what you were saying, that it's along the same lines you are thinking in the UN that you should not uh, have peacekeeping at one side, uh, prevention at another, but you try to mix it. But my concern is, even if I think this is... Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Robert, but... Uh, 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 yeah, I'm sorry, Mr. Robert, but... Yeah, but even if it is, uh, it's really a good idea. The problem is that the long-term aid is going to suffer, suffer uh, because of this, because all the money will be going uh, to uh, refugees and uh, peace uh, prevention. Uh, because you have seen this uh, uh, decline in development aid, especially in Denmark, uh, uh, not in all countries, but in some countries. And well, there is a lot of questions uh, uh, involved in, in what you say. Uh, one, the major problem right now with Denmark, uh, as well as a number of other European countries, is that we are not increasing, we are uh, decreasing the total amount of international civil assistance. At the same time, we're taking a share, we, we are reducing the overall budgets and we're taking a, a, a larger share of that to support refugees coming to our own shores. And we're taking a share of, of the uh, decreasing rest of the budgets 
uh, to support the necessary support of uh, short-term humanitarian relief on the cost of long-term development assistance. That's a problem. Uh, and, uh, and this contradicting the commitments we actually made in Addis Ababa for financing of development and in Paris for supporting the least developed countries uh, to uh, uh, living up to the climate agreement. That, that's one point. The, over, uh, the composition and overall uh, budgets for international assistance. And so of course, you cannot count the military contributions uh, to the ODA, to the uh, 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 civil international development assistance. Uh, but having said that, I think it's, it's uh, necessary to look uh, on uh, uh, more holistic on the military interventions to end conflicts and the peace building uh, architecture work afterwards. And if I should substantiate that, it, it, it should only be by saying, well, we can't, uh, we can't support the development assistance in each and every place in the world, even if we go back to the, the old level of development assistance. And it is, of course, sensible. Uh, it's, it, it's a logic that uh, when we have participated in a peacekeeping operation somewhere, uh, that, uh, uh, and that we after that, uh, direct some of our long-term development assistance to support institutional uh, building uh, in some of the uh, former conflict-torn countries. That's, that's a good idea, and that consists with, that's consistent with the, uh, the uh, efforts we are developing right now, as I told you just a moment ago, about how to integrate mediation peacekeeping operations, peace building architecture in a much more holistic way than we have been able to do it up till now. Do we have time for a couple of more questions? Yes. Okay. Hello and thank you for, for taking your time to speak to us here today. Um, my question might be a little more specific than the other questions, but... I have difficulties in hearing you. Okay, uh, well, thank you for taking your time to speak with us today. Uh, my question might be a little more specific than the other questions, but I would like to know uh, if the UN has any activities uh, regarding to, to the peacekeeping um, uh, project in violent countries in Central America. Uh, you spoke about the, how it is important for the women or for the UN that the women um, get a voice in all this and, and how they <coughs> sorry, how it is important to empower them in, in the countries where, where the peacekeeping operations are a must. So I would like to know if the UN has any activities in, in the Central American countries where they're in is a great need for the peacekeeping operations. Um, yeah, and where the women are some of the biggest losers. Were you able to hear the entirety of the question? Not quite. If I understood you right, you asked about Central America peacekeeping operations. There are no UN peacekeeping operations right now in Central America. Uh, there are a lot of post-conflict efforts to be developed in order to strengthen institutions to support uh, uh, indigenous people's rights, for instance, women's rights, uh, after conflicts that the ones we have had over many, many years in Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, whatever. Uh, and and uh, I think that uh, if, if we have the resources, part of, the, of what you could call the, uh, the budgets for, for, for UN peace building architecture, could be very well used also in some of the former conflict-torn uh, uh, countries of Central America. But there are no peacekeeping operations going on right now uh, because there's, there's no out, or outright military confrontations going on. Actually, Latin America uh, is now with the upcoming, hopefully uh, very soon finished, peace agreement in Colombia. 
is a part of the world now uh, free of outright military conflicts, civil, ongoing civil wars, which is a very positive uh, uh, development in that part of the world. All the questions? Um, I was wondering if you could talk about some of the ways that you incorporate or engage uh, minorities uh, like women in the peacekeeping operations and how that might affect the peacekeeping. Well, there are a lot of, of, of uh, considerations about that. Uh, more, more women participating in, in, in uh, the, uh, the work with build, the peace building architecture, but also taking part, uh, maybe often in the more soft parts of the peacekeeping operations. But also, and most importantly, I think, uh, uh, bringing the much stronger voice of the women actually living in the conflict torn areas uh, uh, into the dialogue of how we should perform uh, the peacekeeping operation and avoid uh, 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 the uh, very bad, bad treatment of, of women and girls in, in many areas. Not only, of course, uh, as a primary thing, uh, avoiding that the UN troops themselves are contribution to the problems, but, but on the other way, uh, way around that the UN troops on the ground will be supporting the protection of, 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 of women against uh, the dangers they are meeting uh, in conflicts and civil wars around the world. There is a lot of uh, good ideas about that also expressed in a actually uh, rather old Security Council resolution, I think number is 1325, and we'll try to integrate some of those ideas in the outcome of the, uh, the Highlands Met debate I'm holding in, in, in 10th and 11th of May. I'm afraid I have to leave you now. Uh, yes, okay. Well, um... The next meeting is here. Uh, in New York, uh, and wish you a very good discussion for everyone on the board. Thank, thank you for helping us getting the discussion started. Uh, thank you very much, and have a nice day over there. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's move on to the second phase of today's. We're moving on now. Uh, we have some other interesting speakers and answers of questions for you today. Um, we're joined today by uh, Mr. Christian Juhl in the middle. From, uh, he's a Danish uh, member of parliament from Enhuslisten or the Red Green Alliance in English. And uh, he has been involved in many debates about global issues and takes a lot of interest in these issues. And we have had uh, Christian visit us before in the same auditorium for, for a similar debate. And we're glad to welcome him back. And um, we're uh, in today's panel is also Mr. Osman Farah out here. Uh, Osman is an assistant professor at the Department of Culture and Global Studies here at Aalborg University. He's very interested uh, and currently researches in African conflicts and peacekeeping. So we're glad to have him today as well. And finally, we will also hear from Mr. Finn Reske Nielsen, who is the vice chairman of our local NGO. Um, he's a former assistant uh, general, general secretary of the UN, and he's worked in a number of different positions in the UN within almost the last uh, 40 years. What will happen now is that uh, each person in the panel will give a brief presentation related to the subject of uh, peacekeeping operations. Um, for about 10 minutes and if you have been to all, any of our events before you know that we sometimes take a liberal approach to, to the time frames that we have announced so uh, I'll ask the members of the panel to, to keep it at around 10 minutes 
We do not want to miss out on any of the important issues you have prepared, but we would like to uh, have some time remaining for questions from the audience. Because after each of the panel members have given a brief presentation, you will again have the opportunity to, to ask questions, just like we did before with Moses Legatov. We will again have a microphone on each side, and you just raise your hand, and you will ask some questions to maybe a specific person or the entire panel, and that might ensue a debate between the participants, and it might just be a brief answer. I'll be the moderator of that, so I hope we'll get an interesting discussion. I think that was it, so let's uh, give a warm welcome to the panel as well. I have asked uh, Mr. Christian Yu to, to initiate today's panel presentation, so go ahead. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. My background is uh, the Workers' Union, and we have been working with the Workers' Union in the third world, especially in Asia and Africa, and a little bit in Central America, where it's, you can lose your life if you are organizing as a unionist. And we have tried to build up unions because we find it's one of the most important things that people have the right to organize themselves and to uh, defend their rights, defend a, more, a, a good life for themselves and their families. One of the good things. When we discuss this team, uh, this, uh, 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 what we have to discuss today, we normally is working with five or six levels. For me, the main, the main initiative is Development Aid, Strategic Development Aid. I totally agree with the one who asked, isn't it a big problem that we lose money for strategic aid in these years? And it is. The second level is the, the, the possibility of mediation before a conflict is rising. The third is possibility for sanctions, economical sanctions, non-military uh, sanctions. The fourth level is peacekeeping. And for me, it's important that the UN is the leader of the peacekeeping because private or single states have sometimes other uh, ideas about what to do with this peacekeeping. The second highest level is peace building. When the war or the conflict is broken out, then we have to stop it. And then if UN is going in, it's with more heaven, weapon, he heavy weapons. And the last one is stabilizing. And in these years we try to stabilize in Syria. It's not very successful. But that's the level and we have to begin at the bottom. Some of the most of my colleagues in the parliament think we have to begin at the top. And they always say, oh, we are sending the army. And that's the last ultimate possibility we have because if the conflict is rising to that level where we have to send the army, then it's very, very difficult to go back to uh, civil society and democracy and possibilities for the countries. If we forget that, we will run into big troubles. We have now a government and also a global thinking that is saying, oh, we have to think together security, refugees, and trade, and development aid. I'm very critical about this uh, discussion because nearly every time development aid is going to the bottom and is going to be the, the one who is taking up, up all the garbage from the others. When the war has made, made big troubles, then development aid, aid is used to pick up all the troubles. When trade is going the wrong way, development aid is trying to be used to pick up on more uh, equality and so on. That's very bad, and I'm, I'm, I'm more like the EU word called coherence. <coughs> coherence means that you don't do anything that harm the development aid goals. So, so aid, no, so uh, trade, security and refugee activities has to be at the same goal as the development aid. 
when the development aid is our primary goal. Always the primary goal. We don't have to do anything that harms the development aid goal. And now we have 17 of the good goals, and I hope that you have all been studying these 17 goals that we last uh, September was making in New York. It was a very, very incredible good day for the world. The day where every country, every single country, voted for the new 17 development, sustainable development goals. Everybody, every student in our country has to know to the bottom what are these seven goal, 17 goals, how can we realize them and make pressure on the Danish government to say where is your plan, what do we want to do in Denmark, how will you intervene in the European society and how can we realize these 17 goals. We have 15 years to do it, so don't hesitate. The last thing, no, two last things is if we are going to be better we are going to look at the UN forces that most Lucas was telling about. We have to build up a standing force. Years ago we had a discussion and we tried to build up a standing force on the north of Zealand in Denmark with the participating forces from different countries who said that's a good idea. Why is that a good idea? Two things. It can be rapid very fast we can go out to make peace uh, keeping and peace building if necessary. Two, we can have a common standard, a common culture. You heard also monks told about sexual harassment and things like that. And I was in Mali a month ago and we saw the 10,500 people who is under the Danish uh, General Lotus Corps uh, command and he told the frontline soldiers they have very bad clothes, very bad weapons, no vehicles, no protection. But the other people, for instance, the Netherlands people, uh, who is in the middle of the force, not in the front line, they have the most modern weapons, the most modern protections. They always take helicopters with them so they fast can run. <coughs> Backwards, they always have doctors and nurses with them if anything happens with their people. That's the difference between African soldiers who nearly get nothing and their governments take the most of the money from UN, putting in the national economy and don't use it for the, for the peacekeeping force. But Netherlands, they pay extra to be sure that the people are on top on every level. We have to be sure that everybody who is working for UN is well protected and has an optimal possibility to make the work. That's very, very bad that we do it in this way. We pay poor soldiers who have nearly nothing to protect or to defend them. And the, the, the European, they can do uh, what's necessary. Uh, and last thing, when we are in the university, my dream is that we, like other countries, or like Denmark in old days, build up an institute of mediation and peacekeeping uh, uh, science. Why? Because we are very, very on low level when we have to go into a country. One example, Libya. We didn't know how is the civil forces in the country. Is it possible? When we, when we cut off the head of Gaddafi, is there other political forces who can build up the country? We didn't know it. We asked in every university, we said, do we know anything about uh, Libya? No, we didn't. Yeah. Nevertheless, the Danish government said, okay, we're bombing. We are cutting off the head of Gaddafi. And what's happening now? So please make a pressure on our government to get an institute for peacekeeping and mediation so that we have at least 20, 40, 30, 30, 40 uh, people who know what's happening and they can make <coughs> cooperation with other peacekeeping uh, institutes in, in, in Europe. We have in neighbor countries, we have in, in, in my youth, we have it also in Denmark. I have said to our government that we could take at least five of these bombing flights we are going to buy and 
say we don't buy them and then we use these five billion for the university so they can build up this uh, capacity. Thank you very much, Christian Juhl. So after Christian Juhl has um, laid out the, the homework of knowing the 17 SDGs and, uh, and other curriculum and, and maybe even suggestions for new fields of study, which we like very much in the UN Association, um, we'll move on to, to Mr. Finn Leslie Nelson, who will also uh, comment on the issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's wonderful to see so many of you here. Tuesday afternoon, and, and thanks also to Christian who come all the way from Copenhagen to participate uh, in this event along with uh, Mr. Lukaton. As it happens, yesterday I was um, I gave a lecture at um, the University of Southern Denmark, and I asked the students, there were about a hundred of them, I asked them, what comes first to your mind when I say you were peacekeeper? There was this deafening silence for a few seconds, and then one student raised his hand and he said, corruption and sexual abuse. <laughs> That's what he said. Um, and I noticed that Mr. Lukatov actually started out with that, uh, with that point as well. Uh, I, I do have to say, though, as someone who's been working in the organization, the United Nations, uh, for almost four decades, and at least a full decade of that in peacekeeping, uh, I, I can assure you that that does not give due credit to what UN peacekeeping is about. That is not to defend the cases that have been there. And just a few days ago, there was a report that it is expected there would be up to more than 100 new cases um, of alleged sexual abuse in the Central African Republic. That is totally unacceptable and it needs to be addressed. And as you heard Mr. Lukatov say, say it's, it's something that the Security Council and the Secretary General in fact are very much focused on. But so far it's been too little, too late. Um, it's something that is it's totally unacceptable that <coughs> peacekeepers who were there to protect people actually abuse them instead. Totally unacceptable. Nobody uh, would defend that, uh, but it, and it needs to be fought with all available means. Um, but as I said, it, corruption. I won't talk much about that. There's not much corruption in the UN. There have been a few cases, yes, uh, but it's it's nothing like what's happening in Panama at the moment, for instance. Um, but it, it happens in all large organisations. And these things need to be addressed, they need to be addressed vigorously, uh, and I'm sure that they will be. But certainly, to say that uh, that, that uh, the first thing that comes to mind when you say you are peacekeeping is, is, is uh, corruption and, and sexual abuse does not give due credit to the United Nations and the work it does in this area. And let me just, to, to give us a sort of common information base, a big pick up. One of the things that Mr. Lukatov mentioned, um, he said that there are 125,000 UN peacekeepers globally. They are working day in and day out to help maintain the peace. And as he said, the world would be a lot worse off if it was not for those 125,000 <coughs> men and women who in many cases risk their lives daily to support global peace. 125,000 people, that's a lot. In fact, it makes the UN peacekeeping force the second largest expeditionary military force uh, in the world, only second to that of the United, of the United States. Uh, so it's very significant what the UN does in terms of numbers. Um, and um, I, I'm not sure that many of you actually realize the kind of work that's being done on a daily basis. Uh, there are at the moment 16 active peacekeeping operations, mostly in Africa, um, and they do a fabulous job. I can say that. I've been there, I've seen it, uh, done it. 
I, I, I know what they do, and I know that if they were not there, uh, there would be a lot more problems in the world than is the case today. Peacekeeping, of course, goes back many, many years. Um, in fact, the first peacekeeping mission was far back as 1948, and, and it still exists. And you can ask yourself whether that is a sign of success or failure. Um, you could say it's a failure because they haven't solved the problem. But on the other hand, those old missions, and they are there in Kashmir to make sure that India and, and Pakistan don't wage war against each other. They're in the Middle East, for instance, on the border between Lebanon and, and, and Israel to maintain, to, to secure that border. Um, they're in Cyprus. Um, and the reason why you don't hear much about that is precisely because they stabilize the situation. And that is, of course, something that uh, the UN Security Council realizes, and that's why they keep extending these mandates, because they, they say, well, it's not an ideal situation, we need to find a political so uh, solution, but in the meantime, at least we help maintain uh, the peace. Um, so you can debate whether that's success or not. I, I maintain that it is success because you avoid conflict. Um, I, I should also mention, being a, a former UN person, it would be wrong of me not to mention that there are many, many highly successful uh, missions. Uh, you may not be familiar with the history of peacekeeping, uh, but there are many of those. El Salvador was one uh, 20 years ago. Uh, Namibia's independence 25 years ago. Um, recently, uh, the withdrawal of peacekeeping from the small country of East Timor, that's actually where I was for the past 10 years, um, is an indication that, peace, that peacekeeping can indeed be successful. Uh, there are also, truth be told, uh, also many examples of disasters in terms of peacekeeping. There's no denying that. Um, if you look at, uh, I, I think Osman is going to talk about Somalia later on, at least in the early days, that was an unmitigated uh, disaster. You probably, some of you have, have seen the movie Black Hawk Down, which is precisely describes part of that scenario uh, where following the, the death of, was it 18 American soldiers, the, then President Clinton pulled the Americans from the mission and had collapsed. Uh, there are other examples that are much worse. Uh, going back 25, 26 years, in Rwanda, uh, where the UN failed uh, to prevent uh, a genocide that eventually led to the death of somewhere between seven and 800,000 people. So it is a mixed, it's a mixed bag, there's no doubt about it. Uh, but you have to then ask the question, I'm looking at the time, uh, have to ask the question, um, why are some of these why are some of these operations successful, and why are others not successful? And invariably, you get back to one fundamental factor in this equation, and that is that if you do not have unanimity, agreement in the UN Security Council, then chances are that the missions will fail. Why is, is the UN not, so far, not being successful in Syria? Because the big powers of the Security Council cannot agree. <coughs> when they can agree, and I think that I haven't studied this scientifically, uh, but I, I, I think I'm right in saying that whenever UN peacekeeping has been successful, it's because there's been political uh, agreement in the Security Council amongst the main member states, the 193 member states of the UN, then the missions succeed. Also, I one more minute, one more minute, thank you. Uh, also, I want to, to, to highlight uh, some of the points made by Mr. Lukatov, because they're very critical uh, to understanding when peacekeeping works and it doesn't work. There are huge systemic issues. He referred to uh, the, 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 uh, the quality and quantity of the troops that member states put at the disposal of the Secretary General to execute a a, a, a peacekeeping mandate. And he's absolutely right that sometimes the quality of the troops is very poor. 
And that is a challenge. It's something that we didn't like to speak, don't like to speak about in the UN, but it is, it's a fact. And I feel very sorry for those troops that get sent to the front line and they don't have proper equipment. I was in Darfur a couple of years ago and I saw how some of these military contingents, they, they had armored personnel vehicles that could go for maybe five kilometers and they would break down. What do you do when you're in that kind of situation? Discipline is a problem, and that is part of the reason why um, uh, you have cases of sexual exploitation and abuse. And I'm not saying that that goes with a particular you know, set of peacekeepers. It is across the board, first world, second world, third world, it needs to be addressed. So there are a lot of issues here. It also takes a hell of a long time to put a peacekeeping mission together. Uh, just one example, in East Timor, where I was for quite a long time, the Security Council authorized the peacekeeping mission uh, in August of 2006. It wasn't until the late spring of the following year that we had even the basics of what was supposed to be on the ground. Why? Because the member states were slow to respond to requests for troops and, and police officers. So it's a very mixed bag. There are many, many other issues, but I think I've run out of time. So thanks for now, we get back to these issues later. Then yeah, moving on to Mr. Osman yes. Farah. Yes. Uh, my name is uh, Osman Farah. Uh, I'm not a politician, I'm a researcher. And uh, I, I originate, uh, I originate uh, from a region uh, that is very conflictual. They have a lot of conflicts and, and civil wars. Uh, so, so I know uh, I know about these conflicts and I do research about it. Uh, my adopted homeland it is Denmark. Uh, they are uh, there, there are no conflicts in this country. The last time probably Denmark had a conflict war was hundreds of years ago. But the other day I I, I read I read some Facebook uh, input where they uh, where they where they talk about conflict here in Denmark. Uh, there is a disputed area in in in, in, uh, in uh, between Canada and Denmark. Actually, Denmark and Canada, they, they, they dispute a, a small island. <laughs> and what, what happens is that uh, Danish uh, soldiers, when they go there, they, 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 they conquer that island, and then they retreat from it. But before they retreat, they, they leave some drinks there uh, for the Canadians, because the Canadians will come, and then, and then the, the Canadian soldiers will stay there, and then they will conquer that island, and then they will retreat, and then they will leave some drinks from there. So, it is very interesting, this kind of conflict. There are soldiers involved, but there is no conflict. So, so we need to find out why these conflicts are very brutal and bloody in some areas in the world, and they are more peaceful here. There are, there are probably the democratic structures and so on. Uh, um, the conflicts, uh, you know, the peace uh, missions and peace operations, uh, look to have mentioned, is mainly in Africa. Actually, there is a lot of focus on Africa. So 100,000, uh, you know, soldiers, uh, Lot of was talking about, they, they focus on Africa. Uh, and it's actually post-Cold War phenomenon. That means it is very, uh, it's very, uh, very relatively very recent. Uh, these numbers have increased since the end of the Cold War. So there, there has to be something that has been holding this back, uh, these, 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 these operations. Uh, the number actually jumped from 13,000 to 125,000, something like that. So, so the number has, has increased. There is a focus on Africa. And, 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 and it's mainly focused on some few countries. For example, Somalia uh, had uh, the largest humanitarian uh, peace missions, uh, uh, as told us, uh, in, in the 1990s. Uh, about 25 or more soldiers were, were involved. <coughs> Currently, Democratic Republic of Congo, they have, uh, they have 24,000 uh, uh, troops stationed there trying to protect the civilians. So, so the focus is in Africa. So uh, Denmark is exporting, you know, peacekeeping missions and other countries, but Africa is receiving it. So there has to be some kind of problem with Africa. Why Africa? Why is it Africa that, that has to receive all, all of this? It has to do with that Africa has a failing or failed state. Uh, actually, the, the state is failing there. Uh, and, and it has something to do with the issue of state and society has not been solved in Africa. In many countries, it has been solved. So the state and, 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 and society relationships, so the governance issue has not been, has not been solved in Africa. So, so that can explain us. And, and, and it has something to do with governance uh, in these states and external legitimacy. So it's an issue of 
uh, Africans and other countries that have, have, have a problem with conflicts to solve their own problems uh, of governance. Uh, and it's also partially related uh, with uh, international governance. Uh, and that's very important. Actually, uh, the local governance legitimacy and the international uh, uh, governance and legitimacy, both of them are very important. I want to share with you, there is a, one of the greatest uh, thinkers in the 21st century, Bronislaw uh, Mornowski, I don't know, uh, some of you, probably the old generation, that they will know him. In the 1940s, uh, he, he, he published a book called Freedom and Civilization. Uh, Mornowski, uh, he, he experienced Nazism, Fascism, uh, Pearl Harbor, and all of these uh, problems. And his argument was, was that we need some kind of governance in this world. Uh, we need some kind of supranational institution that operates beyond the state that, ha that can help us to tackle these, uh, these international problems. Uh, that was his argument. We need some kind of governance. Otherwise, we will have a, a chaos in this world. So he referred to something he called uh, the dilemma of governance. Because there are sovereignties and claims of sovereignties. This is state from that state. So there is a challenge from there. Uh, and in order to manage, uh, we need some kind of international body. Uh, the closest we can get to that institution is the United Nations. The United Nations, actually, is the only platform the world has today to tackle uh, these problems. Uh, the problem is the United Nations does not have an independent army. That means they cannot mobilize an army. Uh, they doesn't have, uh, they don't, uh, the United Nations does not control a territory. They doesn't control a people. So the, the, the challenge is very complicated for, for the United Nations. And even the budget, there are no budgets. Uh, you have been listening, Mount Mons looked up, he was talking about budgets. So United Nations are an institution that can actually mediate these claims, but they don't have budgets. That is the problem. Okay, there are three, uh, I, I, will, I will suggest that there are three uh, you know, periods uh, where the United Nations over time, since 1960s, were involved in governance in Africa, uh, in governance issues. The first was called the nation building period. It started around the 60s. So uh, at that time, uh, nation building strategies. We need to build uh, nations. That was, that was the argument. And then uh, there was actually some kind of convergence because people wanted freedom. And those colonized countries, they were very tired of the Second World War. So they wanted to give uh, some kind of freedom to these societies. So there was some kind of convergence of these freedom issues. But the challenge was uh, uh, the United Nations and other states, they want to, to export this kind of Western, Western model, uh, you can call it. They want to export this kind of Western uh, model, uh, nation uh, state, uh, nation state. This is, this is Westphalian model. Uh, I think some of you know it. Uh, it is from Westphalia, a city in Germany, 1648. So they want to export this to Africa. Uh, so people want freedom, but uh, very short period of time, it ran into trouble because uh, because uh, because it, it did not work. So so we had authoritarianism, we had the Cold War. So Africa was divided into capitalist, socialist era, this kind of thing. The second period was 1980 from 1980s. The period is called uh, society building. Uh, they started to focus not the state now, but the society, the civil societies. We have to empower the civil society and groups and, and that campaign, and it was also okay. But it has created some kind of fragmentation uh, in the society. A lot of NGOs, a lot of civil society, a lot of rebellions uh, in the continent. And then, uh, now, currently, we have some kind of... Uh, and then we had the humanitarian crisis, uh, state failures, and collapse. And now we have something we call uh, transnational securitization uh, issue. Uh, now the world is organized to create some kind of missions that will just protect the capital here and there, and, and, and some kind of new deals, uh, but, but it is very uh, problematic because it is very uh, security focused and, it, and it's very elite focused. So, so you have these three stages, and, and this is the most complex, uh, and, 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 and it, it will probably work. It is ongoing, so, so we don't know what will, what will happen. So, uh, so it is these, these three aspects of governance we have to do when the United Nations and other countries uh, are involved. Okay. The question of what has worked and did not work. We know in the respect what has worked. Uh, we know that uh, you know uh, a combination of a kind of martial plan approach with some kind of social contract 
you know, this bottom up uh, and, 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 and top down strategies will help. That means uh, we have to reduce conflicts. We have to we have to work on uh, reducing conflicts. Uh, and there is a concept in the literature that is used. It's called the triangle approach. The triangle approach that is also very important. That means you will reduce conflicts. You will work on reducing conflict, not increasing it, like like in Syria. What is happening is actually now in, in Syria to increase conflicts, and, and that is problematic. We know this 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 will work. Uh, and the United Nations actually did its, its share of, of, of this. Uh, there, there, there are a number of uh, accomplishments uh, the UN has, has achieved, providing services. There are actually a lot of people around Africa and other places that graduated universities thanks to, to, thanks to the United Nations. There are vaccinations, there are schools, clinics run by. There are actually, uh, 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 there, are, there are areas where there are middle class actually uh, who went to schools, uh, you know, subsidized by uh, the UN or related agencies. So, so we cannot totally criticize uh, these, these organizations. They are producing some kind of tangible, tangible thing. But there are major obstacles. I think I will conclude with the obstacles, you know, the obstacles that confront uh, the, the United Nations. Uh, one of it is what we call reluctant states. That means there are uh, powerful states in, in this world that will just go in into the United Nations work if they can see their own interest. Narrow, narrow interest. That means if, the, if, if there is national interest in the UN, then we will support the UN. If there is no national interest in the UN, we will not support it. That is a very huge problem uh, for the UN to function because the UN needs some kind of sacrifice. So, 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 so it's not just a narrow national interest that has to determine how the world should be, should be saved from, from conflict. Uh, another aspect is regional alliances. Regional alliances have also created some problems uh, uh, when, they are, when they are going to, to do it. Uh, uh, in Africa, regional alliances in Africa, and also the one we know here from NATO and other places, it is also problematic. And that has to be, to be done something. Uh, another issue is the issue of hegemonic states. States uh, that are in the region that are actually trying to dominate these operations and missions. Uh, they are also creating more problems. Uh, so so that has to be that has to be dealt with. So I think I I, I agree with Mohamed uh, Slotov that there is a need for reform. Uh, the kind of meeting they will have in, in May has something to do with the reform in the, the United Nations. Uh, because there are certain challenges. Uh, for instance, uh, the decision of where these operations will go comes from the Security Council. But the funding comes from the member states. So these things have to be, have to be reformed. And then another issue, it has to be, as, as, as Mons Lukto suggested, it has to be civilized. That means it has to be, we need to invest on, on civic, civic components. Uh, one of the problems in Horn of Africa is that the world, the United Nations, they are using more energy for what we call non-state, non-state armed uh, factions, warlords. Their numbers are very few, but they can create havoc uh, to the societies. We need to shift that and focus on uh, what we call productive forces. You know, the large uh, part of the society are involved in agriculture, uh, fishing, telecommunication, transportation. There are a whole range of, of people in the Horn of Africa and other places that are producing goods, uh, so they need to be mobilized and supported. So, so instead of running after Al Shabaab and, and these people, it is very good to look at, at the other side. So, so what we are seeing is, is overemphasis of some kind of violent elements, and then uh, not looking on uh, on the productive side of the society. So, in, in final uh, in final remarks, uh, I think I think I think the the thesis or the uh, the suggestion of. Uh, 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 Marie Lewiski, uh, the professor uh, who actually proposed, we need some kind of uh, structure that can that can that can curb with uh, with, uh, with Nazi fascism and all of these warlords is is still valid because we are still that dilemma. We have we are still in a dilemma of governance in this world. Uh, uh, so there are different claims in this world from states and non-state actors who will mediate uh, these kind of claims. The world has to as to find solutions for that. So far we have the United Nations, at least formally. There are a number of informal uh, places where the world gathers. Davos, for example, you know Davos, 
rich people, they gather, they gather in Davos uh, at, the, at the beginning of January, February, something like that. It is very informal. They, they try to talk about global politics. But, but formally, we have the United Nations as a platform. But the United Nations is, at the moment, very uh, toothless. You know, it, it is very difficult for the United Nations to shunt There are a lot of vetoes. There are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, reluctant states. There are a lot of challenges uh, from that. So, so the dilemma that, uh, that in that book, Freedom and Civilization, from 1944, 47, this is still, this is still very current. So it's very, it's very strange that the world did not address. It is almost uh, 60 years. So, so the world did not address that issue. Thank you. It seems there was some agreement between Osman and uh, Christian Yule in focusing on uh, development, and uh, I'm sure there will be some questions about that. So please feel free to address the panel with a question. We have a question up here. Peacekeeping operations, uh, the mission, the UN mission uh, in in uh, East Timor was uh, around the locals, and um, I heard a lot of people saying um, that they had a bit of a resentment um, from you know there was a bit of resentment from the locals uh, because you are you know outsiders uh, coming in uh, and managing the whole situation, and also because of discrepancy in uh, salaries. Um, and I was wondering, first of all, did you, if you felt that resentment from the locals, and second, uh, if you did, how, um, how did you deal with it? And uh, also, how do you decide when to leave? The situation in uh, uh, East Timor right now is not uh, perfect, if, a bit far from it. Um, there's also always the, the thing about the rebels from the mountains that may come uh, any time, and um, when do you decide to, to leave? Okay. Great, thank you very much. Um, well, that makes two or three of us a bit to East Timor, that's very good. Um, let me try to generalize that a little, my answer a little bit, because what you're saying, in fact, is something that you find in many peacekeeping uh, situations. Uh, First, the principle that there is never a peacekeeping in a country if the country concerned has not asked for it, has not agreed that the mission should be there. It's a very important principle. The UN doesn't, cannot send in a peacekeeping mission without uh, the consent of the country concerned. In the case of East Timor, actually, it was the leadership of the country that approached the Security Council and said, Security has broken down in our country. Our country is burning. Uh, our institutions have collapsed. We need international support. And that was what then prompted the UN Security Council to authorize a big mission that was dispatched with a very broad mandate. And sometimes, sometimes peacekeeping missions have very narrow mandates. In the Middle East, for instance, it's a mandate where troops are positioned in between two opposing parties to make sure that they comply with a peace agreement or some sort of agreement that they have signed. Um, in this day and age, it's much more complex because peacekeeping deals with, more often than not, with internal strife. Uh, and that means that the mandates that are given by the Security Council to peacekeeping missions become much more complex. In the, using East Timor as an example, um, the mission had a mandate uh, to promote human rights, it had a mandate to strengthen democratic institutions, it had a mandate to monitor democratic elections, it had a mandate uh, to support uh, reform of the security sector in that country. And all of these things 
are very, very sensitive. And that means that more often than not, it's actually difficult for a peacekeeping mission to maintain an entirely smooth relationship with the government. Because the mission is there to, to, to execute a mandate that invariably will infringe on the sovereignty of the state concerned. That applies to Timor, it applies to, to, uh, to Sudan, to South Sudan, to all the modern, the modern peacekeeping missions. So there will always be tension, and it, it's, it's, it's a political process of doing this, and some missions do it well, others do it less well. Is there resentment in the general population? Yes, often you will find that. In East Timor, it changed over time. When we first came, and I was actually part of the very first mission way back in 1999, uh, when, when I remember driving into a village once, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a somewhat banged up UN vehicle. It didn't, have a, it didn't have a windscreen and all sorts of things. When the locals saw this UN vehicle, the men stood and saluted. That changed over time. I thought, this is great, fantastic. We would do really well here. It changed over time for a variety of reasons, including the ones I've just mentioned, but also because UN peacekeeping can become very overwhelming. I'm sure Kristen can talk about this too. Uh, in, in the capital of East Timor, about half the vehicles you'll see in the streets were white <coughs> UN land cruisers. What do you see in the restaurants? You see UN staff who go out and eat in the restaurants. They seemingly have lots of money. Well, some of them do, others don't. In fact, because UN soldiers don't get paid a salary. They get paid a small allowance. So they're, but, but they're still very visible and they appear to have it all in a post-conflict situation where, and as these situations, uh, peacekeeping situations are mostly in developing countries, you have this enormous gap between the haves and the have-nots and that leads to tension and sometimes even to rioting. It can happen. But it, but it is also difficult uh, to, to explain. Uh, but it, it, I'm not familiar with any peacekeeping operation in the, in, in the UN where, uh, where the, the, the countries concerned have all mm, unanimously embraced the people and said, you're all wonderful, we love you. The world's not like that for the reasons I've just explained. I hope I answered your question. So I saw a question up here, but before we go to that, I'd like to address uh, Christian Yule a bit here because could that be, you think, this general resentment against the UN peacekeeping troops, could that be the, because of a lack of focus on development um, that people see uh, the more of a top-down uh, approach and feel that they're being, that, that, the, that the, the intervention or the operation of the mission is, is going around them? It could, it could be. In um, in Mali, I think 10 to 20 percent of the total economy in a very poor country comes from UN. And what when they disappear one day? Big troubles if we don't have an alternative development aid or something like that, work for young people and like that. Uh, if we if we don't, it's very very. Uh, close to use this five or six levels in conflict solutions and we can make failures too and of course UN have made failures UN is the is the best we have but it still is a part of the international power the big powers is also having the power in UN it's not the people who just think strategic is people who also think uh, tactics on, on their own country. Think about US, Russia, China, France, and so on. They, they think what's best, best for us. That's why it went very, very bad in Libya. That was, they were entrepreneurs for, for UN or for the international society and said, okay, you are making the, 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 the bad work, bombing and all this, 
And then they said on the way, oh, we also want to, to uh, cut off the head of, of Gaddafi so we can make democracy. Instead, they made chaos. And that's why we have to have clever people who know what's inside the countries of civil society, of political power, of possibility to, for development before we do anything. And if one is calling for us, please help us. We have a big conflict, we cannot solve ourselves. Then we have to discuss very clearly in UN how to solve this conflict. How, what tools do we have? How can we do it? How can we bring people together in peace uh, negotiations? Syria, now we have to... Years ago we had to do something. Now we have a big conflict who is nearly impossible to solve. And I don't think there is a country called Syria when we finish. Because every small group has to be sitting at the, at the table. And one of the big failures is not made of UN or Syria. It's made, made of especially the Western countries. They said, point one, Assad cannot sit on the table, at the table. Iran cannot sit at the table. Russia cannot sit at the table. The small groups cannot sit at the table when we are negotiating peace. What's happening? Nothing. The war was continuing. We tried once more. Even with the Danish uh, uh, Sondal, who was the foreign minister, sitting at the table, and we said to him, please remove and let, and let uh, Assad sit on this table, because we cannot negotiate peace with our, our enemies at the table. Now, everybody realizes more than 200,000 deaths, we have to do something else. Let them sit at the table at point one. Point two, what is, when we make a ceasefire, then we can begin maybe negotiating peace. Then we can discuss a strategy for rebuilding the country. Maybe also, if we are lucky, rebuilding some areas with, with the democracy. We have to discuss all these things. It's very difficult. I assume most people here know, but just to make sure, the, the, the case with Libya that Christian is referring to was that the Security Council agreed on a resolution based on the R2P doctrine to protect the civil population. But when the, the intervention began, it became a politically motivated um, intervention which removed the, the Libyan government. and. The, the Security Council did actually not agree on this to okay. begin with, and that's why the, the mission collapsed, just to make sure that... Because it's, it's, a very, it's a very recent and it's a very concrete example of, of why something goes wrong when, when there's no agreement. Okay, I think you've waited long enough. Sorry, yeah. Christian. This yeah, uh, thanks. Wiske uh, Jacobsen. I'm a second semester here at uh, Politics and Administration at Alvo University. Um, I'm actually glad that we, uh, we stopped at Libya, because uh, I want to take it up again. Um, my question is to Christian you. Uh, specifically, um, what was the alternative to bombing Gaddafi? Because I feel like at the point Gaddafi was standing and it was, we were speaking about actual genocide, right? Um, so, so what could we have done differently? Like we, we had to go in and, as you say, cut, cut his head off. I mean, there's a lot of discussion that goes into it, but I mean, don't you just have to act sometimes to prevent genocide? Thank you. Christian, go ahead. Point one, nobody knows if there really were a risk of genocide. But we agree there are risk of gen genocide. Then we have to do something. Okay, then we ask UN at the first time. I don't accept that single countries is taking hand on power themselves. So we ask UN, would you make to make a resolution? They did it then we have to follow this resolution and not to follow our own policy in UK or France or US. We said yes in my party to follow the UN resolution. And when we saw that they have an, a political uh, agenda, we said stop, we are not a part of this. Uh, and we, hope, we hoped that the Danish government did the same. But they uh, just shouted at us and said we were crazy, we have to do it. The alternative was to put in the people and say, now we are protecting Benghazi 
and the uh, the UN soldiers, peacekeeping soldiers, not heavy bombards from uh, the other countries. And then we have to discuss the different groups. And then we also have to discuss with Gaddafi. It's really crazy. Yes, the Western governments have been clapping Gaddafi on the shoulder and said, you are our friend because you are taking all the refugees, keeping them in Africa. We will make trade with you, we will help you with everything. They sold even weapons to him. And suddenly they wanted to cut off his head. That's a double morality. And that's not good. You have to stop, and maybe it's a crazy situation, but when you don't know that the situation will be better when you intervene, you have to wait until you know that it's okay. Most of the wars where we intervene the last 20 years when I've been an adult, we have, we have left the countries in worse situations than when we came. That's really thinkable. Uh, Finn has a quick comment and then we have some people up here who have been waiting a while. Just, just to make it, I agree entirely with what uh, Christian is saying. Um, of course, it's not an unusual situation. And, and I think the term is, you win the war and lose the peace. Yeah. Uh, and that brings me back to a very important point that Mr. Lukatoft made earlier today when he said there has to be a holistic approach to conflict solving. And you need to essentially start with a political analysis. And that's why I'd really like Christian to go back to Parliament and say to them, uh, establish a, a, a faculty for, for these yeah. things at our university. Because you need that capacity to analyze the situation, not go in there and bomb and, and, and kill. Uh, that happens sometimes in any case. But you need to look at the political situation. You need to look at what comes after. Look what's happened in Afghanistan. Look what's, what, what's happened in Iraq. Years of war waged by essentially by one big power, uh, with sometimes with active, active support from small states, um, going in there and not thinking beyond the political, the, 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 the military objective, and that is why it's failed. And my, what I would say is that probably the UN would have been a much better alternative. Uh, because there would be more than just the, 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 the military bit. Uh, there would have been issues of building or rebuilding nations and states. And the UN is better placed to do that, do that than any bilateral is. I maintain that. Thank you. We have some questions up here. Yep. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I have a question about the African peacekeeping operations. Uh, I was at an uh, election uh, two weeks ago. I don't remember the keynote speaker's name, but he argued um, also, uh, for one of the points that you argued about, uh, the cultural differences between uh, not, not just the soldiers uh, and, uh, and what uh, connected to these uh, peace operations, but also at the political level, uh, he argued uh, that the African Union was very uh, was, was very, very good uh, opposition to these uh, problems, and I don't uh, and I don't know why you have failed to mention the African Union in uh, any of your. Uh, um, lectures uh, here today, but uh, I was just wondering why uh, the UN doesn't uh, do a better effort to support the African Union because they actually have uh, very good uh, strategies and the, the to and the hand on and hands on approaches to these uh, to these problems uh, regarding the African peacekeeping operations. Uh. Thank you. I think uh, Osman would uh, answer that first. Um, yeah, I I don't know why we didn't why why we didn't mention uh, the African Union. Yeah, it, uh, the African Union is very relevant, yes, of course, because the uh, uh, African Union also established a Security Council. We have their own Security Council and security security infrastructure on uh, on where to go and where to send. Uh, and, and there are actually operations taking place in Africa in Darfur, Sudan, and other places. That is called hybrid hybrid uh, operations. That means. Uh, these operations consist uh, a joint operation with the United, United Nations and, and African Union. So, so there's a lot of uh, coordination uh, going on. Uh, yeah, you might. It's, it's working now. Yeah, yeah. good. Yeah. So, um, so there is a lot of uh, coordination. You know, the whole effort of, of UN peacekeeping missions 
has something to do with cooperation and coordination. And, and this is very important. Uh, there is a lot of things that has to be coordinated. But what has happened, uh, and I think Finn has been there, 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 there are successive stories, of course. You have the East Timor, and then you have Cambodia, and then you have uh, uh, Slovenia, and you have, you have these countries where, where, where the UN has uh, more or less uh, uh, you know, implemented some kind of peace, peace infrastructure. But there are also failures like Iraq and Afghanistan and this, these missions. So, so what, what has been happening more recently is some kind of delegation of tasks, uh, among others, to the African Union and, and others. So, and, and this created some problems. Uh, the UN takes uh, the political responsibility and then they recruit some kind of uh, African Union troops and others that are not uh, as uh, Christian. Uh, told us uh, well acute and uh, probably some of them are not, not well trained. So, so you have challenges in that aspect. And I think one student earlier said uh, 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 one of the strange operations that are going now is uh, in the Horn of Africa. You have countries that are suffering from civil war themselves, but they actually send troops to, to, to stop another civil war. So, so you have some strange uh, constellations. And, and it tells you these things are not fully, fully. For example, a country like Burundi, a country like uh, Sierra Leone, uh, you know, they, they send troops to Somalia. So, so the people there in the of Africa, they just laugh at it and say, well, what are you doing in this country? Yeah. So, uh, probably these things have to be have to, have to be looked at uh, how to how to do it. But what is happening now is is very uh, the fragmentation of tasks, and that is very natural. Actually, actually, these issues are not are not fully coordinated and cooperated, uh, and there is a tough competition between the states. Uh, I saw in the Horn of Africa, who will lead the mission? You know, uh, countries, the UK and Turkey, they campaign. You know, there was a very very intense campaign uh, uh, that the UK they want their people to be installed there, and, and, and Turkey they want to, their country to be installed there. So, so there is a lot of national interest hindrances on on. on on, uh, what I have been talking earlier was, I think, we, sh we need to respect in the future the issue of freedom and dignity. Yeah, you, you know, the people in Africa and other countries, they are not just in interested in peace missions like that. They, they are interested in peace and freedom as the people here. So, so, so it's not just an issue of food, distribution of food, this kind of thing. We are human beings. So Africans and others, what they need is, is freedom and dignity. And that is why, they, why there was a convergence in 1960s. Because because Africans and other countries, they saw the United Nations as a decolonizing uh, factor, you know. They, they, they associated themselves because, because the United Nations, I don't know, uh, Dark Hammer, you know, Dark Hammer? Hammer These people, they were very anti-colonial, uh, you know, structures. So, 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 so the people who led the United Nations at the beginning, in the early stages, were very anti-colonial and they wanted to liberate the world. So many people around the world actually associated with them. Today, it's very different. Today, people are very resentment, as you said. They're very, they are not uh, very, very positive about, about it. So the studies I made, actually, uh, people say the United Nations sometimes is not neutral. It represents strong countries, hegemons, alliances, and it represents the West, because it is the West that pays the most. You know, the, the, the budget of the, of the United Nations comes from the West. So, so there is a challenge from there to actually uh, shift uh, the focus from the, from the West. And this is what probably was looked of, and Finn and others have been discussing on reforming the UN and including the Security Council in India, South Africa, and Brazil in the future. However, Osman, um, talking about the African Union, um, wouldn't it be right to assess that the challenge is also that not any African state would be, would be interested in missions from the African Union due to regional competition, maybe, whereas they would rather see uh, what they perceive as a, as a, as more, a global or a coalition, international, more international coalition-led um, mission in their, in their state. I don't know about Africa, but I was just wondering. Is, is that yeah, yeah that, that, that is the case. Yeah. Uh, people actually, you know, now you have Somalia uh, peace operations, delegated peace operations by Kenya and Ethiopia. Ethiopia and Kenya are historical rivals of Somalia. Mm. So, so this is very strange uh, that the EU and others are actually funding, uh, funding this 
uh, without solving the conflict, the border disputes, regional disputes between these countries. So how in the world can Kenya and Ethiopia create peace in Somalia? It is like sending lion to, to a kind of uh, chickens or something like that. It is very tough. It is very, it is not possible. So, so that is why Al-Shabaab and others are actually getting, getting base every day, because they refer to these two countries as enemies. So, so, so these things have to be uh, renegotiated, and probably uh, uh, countries from Denmark and others have to be sent to the, to the region that have more credibility in terms of human operations. As we today, we, we try to make it a mixture of a Q&A and a panel debate, so I, I have to uh, allow for some in, internal uh, um, comments down here before we move on to the next question. So, Christian, you had a comment first? Just Sean, uh, because that's very interesting. Uh, the African Union is playing a very important role together with the UN in a lot of cases. That's very important to, to, to discuss. Uh, discuss also the Western Sahara other question, uh, the only country who is not in the African U uh, Union is, uh, is Morocco. They went out because the rest of African states said you have to go away from the last colony in Africa, uh, that's West Sahara, West Sahara. In Mali, there is the UN, uh, the UN forces on the UN commando. And there is 3,000 soldiers from France outside the UN command. Why? Because that's the old uh, colony uh, country who rules in Mali and who has big, big interests. So it's still important to say, to find out the real power, you always have to follow, it, follow the money to see what economical interests are in this question. If you want to read more about this, I think one of the best articles we've been wrote, written about it, that's uh, Jan Estrup and Preben Willian, who wrote a, an article about regionalizing UN uh, three years ago. They are very, very good ideas. I'm, I'm supporting the idea of regionalizing the responsibility for UN, also so that Africa could have a UN regional power and Asia and Latin America and so on. That could, be, that, that could uh, solve some of the problems with the, the, the Security Council, because we have really troubles in the Security Council. There's former colony states who are sitting still. The people who won, the countries who won the Second World War is still in power in the UN. And Finn has a comment, and then we'll move on to, I think it was up here first, and then right here. Thank you. Um, just, just to comment on, on sort of the nature of the United Nations, it's very important to realize that the United Nations is not a supranational organization. It's not a world government. It is composed of 193 member states, each of which has a say. They're not equal, and certainly not the Security Council, um, but it is an organization of sovereign states. And that is both a blessing and the opposite of a blessing. Um, it, is, it is a blessing because when you have unanimity amongst the 193 uh, member states, it means that there is tremendous legitimacy to what the United Nations has to say. The problem arises when, when there are disagreements. And this, again, is reflected in particular in the Security Council, as Christian was saying, uh, you still have the old big powers reflecting the, the power, the global power situation in 1945, and that has changed. France and, 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 and the UK are no longer world powers. And at the same time, you've had the, the losers in the Second World War, Germany and Japan, have joined and are major, major economies, major players globally and regionally. You have up and coming countries, uh, developing countries such as India, such as Brazil, such as South Africa, such as Nigeria, and they quite legitimately are saying, well, where is our seat at the table? And that is one of the problems that needs to be resolved. It is extremely difficult to do. Kofi Annan, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, tried to do this before he stepped down in 2006, he couldn't 
there needs to be agreement, and it's a very, very difficult problem to tackle. My fear is that if it is not tackled in the foreseeable future, it will undermine the credibility of the United Nations as a major player in global affairs, because people will say the organization is no longer representing the global community, and that would be, could be detrimental to much of the work that the UN is doing. Oh, sorry. Uh, who, who has the questions up here? Yeah. Because then we'll go here first. Yeah. Right. Can we go here first? Because I think who has the question up here? Uh, you have oh, sorry. I, what, what I have a question up here. And okay. I think he was 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 she first? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Decide. Sorry, she was first. Thank you. So my question is for Mr. Finn. Uh, I was actually traveling in Blasumpa and it was. Uh, Tendera, which is very close to Bula, Timur. And I met, personally, I met a lot of people from East Timur. They were sharing with me their contradiction of feelings towards to Indonesia. So it's like, on one hand, they hate the armies, Indonesian armies, uh, who stationized in East Timur. They were sharing with me their experience, like how they were discriminated and violently treated. But on the other hand, they also, East Timors, they also have a lot of family members stay in Indonesia. So they also feel they have some connections with Indonesia. So my question is, I, I believe that time there were a lot of conflicts between like Indonesia and East Timor. And uh, obviously, Indonesia is economically, geographically, geographically is more powerful compared to East Timor. So when your own peacekeeping organization work uh, in this kind of situation, how did you deal with the influence from the more powerful parties in order to you know, kind of protect the vulnerable ones. And uh, my second question is about uh, in dealing with these conflicts, do you also involve the residents, like normal people from, for example, East Timor, the more vulnerable countries? And how did you make sure their voice being heard? Because I feel like uh, when you, uh, like uh, you earn as a big organization, uh, when you work uh, with, when you deal with conflicts, it's more like in a governmental level. And uh, but when you talk to the normal residents, their opinions probably sometimes different from what uh, uh, your goal setting it is. Then, but it's still their country. And how did you make sure what you did is actually what they want? Yes, Phil. Thank you. Um, again, I'll try, try to broaden the answer a little bit. Um, a f another, I mentioned earlier that a fundamental principle of UN peacekeeping is the consent of the country concerned, or countries concerned. Uh, similarly, a, a fundamental principle guiding all UN peacekeeping is impartiality. Impartiality. What does that mean? It means that the UN will not take sides it will be true to the mandate that the Security Council has given to the mission and will work from there. So, so it would be incorrect to say that in the case of East Timor that, that the UN was pro-East Timor and anti-Indonesia. Anti it's not like that. Uh, at the same time, what you're talking, what you're saying in terms of, in terms of, of, of the, um, uh, the, the big neighbor, East Timor's big neighbor, uh, and Timor being a very small country, that needs to be taken into account. And of course, the Timorese have been very wise in terms of mending their relationship with the Indonesian government very quickly. So in fact, they're good neighbors now, and that is good. Uh, when it comes to the question of dealing with what you, I think you call or, you said ordinary people, yeah. um, that is fundamental for any peacekeeping mission. Uh, perhaps much more so today than 40 years ago when you placed 
a UN military force between two armies, then you didn't really need that. But nowadays, when the mandates are much more complex, you do need to you need to hear everybody. You need, and I don't think there is any modern UN peacekeeping mission that doesn't have an extensive network to consult with, not just with NGOs, but with ordinary people, with civil society in general, because there's so much input that comes from from there that we can make or break a mission. That is more complex in a situation where the legitimacy of the government is questioned. And often in conflict, of course, there will be, for instance, rebel groups that will say that government is not the legitimate representative of government of this particular country. Then it becomes complicated. But when, as in the case of East Timor, nobody, nobody doubted the legitimacy of the government. So therefore, at the political level, a major interlocutor, of course, was the government, as it should be. They were the, the, the democratically elected, are the democratically elected representatives of the people. But it needs to, you need to, to have that consultation at all levels, from the very top through the regional level down to local levels, in order to get a full picture and in order to hear all the voices. And not least, as Mr. Lopetov said, the voice of the women, which tend, and women in many countries tend to be voiceless. Nevertheless, they are major contributors to peace and stability. And in defense of the UN, it's, I think it's also important to notice that the UNDP development uh, organization, they, they work under the same conditions never to engage in any uh, um, issues in a, in a country or sovereign state without the consent of that state. Um, it would be hard to imagine them doing so, but nevertheless, it's an, it's an, it's an important um, bottom line essential of, of, uh, of the UNDP as well. Just wanted to mention that. And now we've waited a long time to ask a question. Thank you. Um, so you have all been talking about how national interest is usually one of the most, the biggest obstacles for the United Nations to actually utilize these operations that we've been talking about. So I was wondering if one of you or any of you have any kind of dream scenario or dream structure of how to minimize this uh, national interest in the UN's policies. Who would you like to have starting? Everyone. <laughs> like <them. laughs> Let's go from Osman and work our way here. And, and if you try to keep it a bit brief, we will have time for, for more questions. But it is a question that uh, validates. Yeah. Uh, 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 you know, um, uh, people think that this national state we have is, has always been there. You know? It is very, uh, it's very recent invention. Uh, the nation state. The issue of nationalism is just uh, 200, 250 years, something like that. So. But people take it for granted. They think that this nationalism has always been there, you know, but, but it has not been there. It was actually uh, uh, in relation to urbanization and industrialization, and, and then we had we had nationalism. You know. So nationalism and national interest is very recent. So so the world has been uh, more globalized in the past, and it is becoming globalized again. You know. So so the issue is how to how to overcome how to overcome this national issue. You know. There has been a lot of uh, attempts to do it. You know. Europe did it. Uh, the, the EU in structure is actually a process uh, that tries to, to overcome. Uh, the EU is supranational uh, now; it's in, it's in crisis. But it is uh, it is a peace project, and it is an attempt to overcome this national focus. So uh, scholars in this world uh, who, who believe these kind of issues think that sooner or later the world will adopt some kind of uh, some kind of global structures. And institutions, and it's already happening in environmental areas. And there are a whole range of issues. You cannot travel to Australia, for example, without without using some transnational, uh, not supranational, but institutions that that take you from Denmark to Australia. So, so you don't feel it, but when you are traveling, actually, you are crossing a lot of treaties, a lot of a lot of agreements. When you are you just sit in the plane and to Australia, but you are actually uh, using some kind of these kind of uh, these kind of. Uh, beyond national structures uh, in terms of travel, in terms of environment, in terms of security now. No, no country can protect itself from non-state actor terrorism. Do you know any, any country in the world that can protect itself? Uh, when you listen to leaders, they will tell you that we, we can't do it. 
So, so in order in order to protect uh, in order to protect Denmark from uh, non-state armed violence, you have to use these kind of uh, institutions. Yeah. So, if you ask me, I think I think these 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 national structures can be overcome, but but it will need a return to to, to freedom and human rights. And there are certain values, uh, moral ethics, that has to be focused and, and away from. The security and, and what happened in Libya, for example, and, and other places. We need to, we need to. I think Lord Tostos mentioned we need to empower the civic dimensions. There is some kind, of, there is a need for some kind of civility that has never been the case since 2001. Actually, uh, since since the end of the Cold War, we had unilateralism, and we had a number of issues where uh, the military has to solve this this issue. But we have the consequences now: with the Afghanistan, and Iraq, and the Horn of Africa military operations have more or less faith. So a military, military operation is built on national interests. So we need to go beyond uh, this narrow national uh, frame and, and, and militarization, and then go to uh, the old uh, United Nations system where you had a dialogue. And, and, and there are elements, of course, you know, not violent, non-state actors. They are very minor groups. If the world unites, these groups can be, can be eliminated in the future. Okay. Question? <laughs> The answer is surely this article. I will please uh, let, read it. It has an eye opener for me and for a lot of other people. And they wrote it as Danish politician, Ernest is the chairman of the UN uh, organization, and the Prime Million is a former left wing uh, politician from, uh, from the Danish parliament and who is working for the United Nations in different countries, building up uh, civil society, police, organization, and so on. And there are two questions. Originally, UN said national sovereignty is the main question. Nothing about this. Then we, years ago, got the responsibility to protect. If a non-governmental, a non-state power tried to make troubles inside, and there was a, a war inside the country, then we could, if there was risk of genocide and things like this, we could have the rights as UN to say we have to do it. Rwanda was the real main question who pushed these uh, changes in UN uh, rules. So please, regionalization of UN, changing of the Security Council is two of the main questions. Regional responsibility and another way of uh, dealing power in the Security Council. That's two main questions in this article. And please also do some ideas and continue the, 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 the debate. Why in Denmark would people say we are not US, we are not powerful? But the two writers said maybe there has to be some countries who still have big credibility in the UN system. We still have, even that we are changing these years. And they have enough credibility if they go together with all the Scandinavian countries and go to the, the General Assembly and say we have to change. That's maybe better than the powerful. In this, in this question also is to discuss how do we deal with using our money for multilateral things and bilateral things. The tendency is that more and more countries want to decide where the money has to go, and less and less country wants to contribute to the multilateral activities in UN. That's dangerous. It's a big failure. When I was young, we gave 50% for the multilateral and 50%. Now we give 20 to 30% to the multinational and the most to the bilateral because they want to make politics, as they say. That means they want to make trade and help Danish companies or help refugees in Denmark who have nothing to do with, with development aid. That's also a question you have to realize and it's dangerous that UN don't get the money they need. Syria, they get half of the money for the refugees. UN cannot help at the level that is necessary in the refugee camps and for the near areas. 
half of the money they get because the donors don't want to pay. Thank you. Let me, let me say I, I agree entirely with that. Let me just add that for as long as the global order or the, the, the fundamental unit in the world is the nation state, that's something we have to live with. And it, it puts restrictions on what the United Nations can do. Having said that, it is of course uh, still possible for a world body to maneuver, to continue to develop a set of values, norms, rules that the international community will agree to abide by. And that helps. And that is one of the most overlooked and perhaps one of the most important roles of the United Nations system, setting the, setting the rules. And there are hundreds and hundreds of conventions that the United Nations has brokered over the years that help to regulate what the global community does and how it does it. One of the latest examples of that is what uh, both um, uh, Osman and, and Kristen talked about, the responsibility to protect. And there is a good example of how everybody agrees, I think, that if there is the risk of a genocide, and it is the responsibility of the international community to intervene. In other words, if there is a situation where a nation state fails in its responsibility to protect its own citizens, and it is the moral and perhaps even legal obligation of the international community to intervene. So you would not have a situation of losing 800,000 lives in Rwanda, as it happened in Rwanda uh, in 1994. Um, but having said that, it is also difficult to do, and there are many examples of, of, responsi of, of the responsibility to protect uh, not being executed. In fact, I am not familiar with a single UN mission that has been fully successful in protecting, in, in protecting uh, civilians under the principle of responsibility to protect. And there are many reasons for that. One of them is that UN operations, military operations, are very likely armed. They don't have the capacity to do it. I've seen it in Darfur. They can't do it. They have, you know, in a given location, maybe 50 soldiers and some armored personnel vehicles, and these warlords have uh, tanks and, and, and heavy weapons. How do you do it? So that it, it, it's a mixed, it's a mixed bag. The world is complicated, but it all goes down to the issue of sovereign states. And I'm, I haven't yet heard many people say we must have the UN as a world government tells us all what to do. We can't even agree whether the European Union should have more power. <laughs> there are only 27, 28 countries <laughs> in that organization. And what I think you were asking was also a bit of a philosophical, maybe theoretical question. And I think the nation perception of the nation state is, is, is ruling, as, as we can say, in the world. However, abolishing the thought of, of a national identity also seems a bit dangerous, which could lead to domination of, of bigger nations over smaller nations. National identity is is one of the one of the main um, motivational factors behind the new um, SDGs, for example. Whereas in the Millennium Development Goals, we we had uh, more focus on the pressure being on the development countries. Whereas in the SDGs, we have a focus on the developed world uh, also changing to adapt to the needs of, of smaller nations. So we don't want to abolish the, 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 the perception or the thought of, of, of national interest, but of course I think if, if, you, if you like the UN and you like uh, the, the thought of, of a global identity, you, you recognize the danger of, of national interest, of course. So it's, it's really complex, but mm. very good question. Um, and uh, the, the, the article question was referring to, we'll, we'll put it on our, on our Facebook page, uh, so you don't have to go to the trouble of finding it. Yes, uh, I think we have another question. Okay. Yes, this is in regards to if I don't miss you or something, but I believe that uh, the, first, oh, the first speaker and a person who has a question mentioned how a lot of the resources you believe is spent uh, on refugees, 
um, yet we see that there's actually a failure in UN uh, run healthcare services and that a lot of the Syrian refugees in Lebanon and Jordan and I believe that the Sudanese refugees in uh, in Kenya, they actually have like a food cut, uh, a cut in food rations. So what I believe is, uh, isn't it kind of the UN's duty and responsibility also in regards to how the UN <coughs> actually has failed, perhaps you can say that, uh, in solving some of these uh, conflicts that have been, as an example, in well, Palestine, <laughs> Palestine and uh, in other countries. So do you still believe that we have these human beings who are like in crisis and who are in need of help, that there's still too much money spent on them? Who are you addressing? I'm sorry. Oh, I, I don't. I don't remember who it was. But it was the, the first. The first, first speaker. speaker and that's Christian Hume. We are not in need of money. That's the first. You can see the people who have the money. They don't want to pay tax. We have scandal after scandal after scandal, and one single scandal can give money for uh, development aid for more years. So if you want to not reduce the tax organization to make control, then we have the possibility to, to get the money. Also for refugees in Denmark. But we have to reorganize the development aid. I accept that helping refugees in the countries near to conflicts, that can be a part of development aid. But I don't accept that money used in Denmark for refugees is development aid. This has to come from another place. We have to pay and we have to help them, of course. But why take it from the poorest people in the world to give to them? Today, it is so that the one, the single country that, that get most of the money from the Danish ref, uh, development aid is Denmark. Because we take it from the poor countries, use it in, in the local municipalities for the refugees. Please, I don't know what it's called in English, but in Danish it's called English Ministerium. Minister of Interior. Yeah, Minister of Interior. Please take it from this uh, part of the state budget, if it's refugees in the municipalities. If you want to help the Danish companies, to make more trade in the whole world, then please take it from the Ministry of Trade, not from the development aid. But don't you perhaps mean that the money should be allocated then, instead of spending less? On yeah, the that's the same, that's why I said about taxes. Okay. We are at the same time using more for our own uh, interests, and at the same time we cut down the, the amount of money. You, you double it, cut down the amount of money and reorganize the money so there are less money for the real strategic work in the world where the poor people is living. That's dangerous. Um, Finn has a comment and then Osman has a comment. That will also be your closing remarks. So after okay. yeah, so after okay. Osman, you'll, Christian, you'll have a minute or so for giving a closing remark. Thank, thank okay. you very much. Th those are very important questions that you raise. And there is no doubt in my mind that the international community has failed. Uh, the internally displaced persons in the Middle East has failed the refugees. Um, would I say that it's the UN? Um, I don't know. Again, I get back to how the UN makes decisions and who makes those decisions within the UN, including the Security Council. Um, but certainly the international community has failed. And a very interesting thing that was pointed out by a senior UN official just a few months ago. He said, have you noticed that the large inflow of refugees, Syrian refugees and others in that region, that that large inflow actually started when the UN, in the shape of the World Food Programme, had to announce that they were no longer in a position to distribute full food rations in the camps. That was when people in the camps realized we cannot feed our families and you had this wave of, of, of refugees uh, moving towards Europe. Uh, was that a failure of the UN? No. 
It was a failure of those that pay the bills. Those, the rich countries, did not provide the necessary funds to ensure that those feeding programs could continue. And there's a lot of, one can generalize that and say, well, a lot of the things that come in the aftermath of conflict, in the aftermath of, of peacekeeping, uh, fail because the money doesn't flow. The rich countries do not contribute. Uh, once the peacekeeping mission is over and there's a need for peace building, there's a need for strengthening institutions, the money is not there. And the UN are not a player, what can we do? We cannot operate without funding. So there, there's a fundamental problem there. So my three sentences in terms of, of concluding remarks. Um, despite the fact that I worked for the United Nations for almost 40 years, I am not a, 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 sort of a purist. Uh, I'm not one of those who say the UN is a wonderful organization. It will solve all the problems in the world. I'm saying the UN is doing a lot of good work. Pro probably not very good at advertising what it's doing. That's why that student in, 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 at the University of Southern Denmark uh, yesterday associated peacekeeping with corruption and, and, and sexual abuse because the UN has not been very good at selling itself despite the good work it's doing. Is it flawless? Far from it. There are many, many issues and most of them we've not had time to, to focus on today. Many issues, lots of flaws in the organization of the world, in, of, of the organization, but I still maintain that it's the best there is. I do not see an alternative. There was a famous person, I forget who was, who said a few years ago, if the UN were to be closed down today, it would have to be reopened tomorrow. Because there is no, there is no alternative uh, institutional arrangement that can help resolve the global problems that we are facing. And that's not just about peacekeeping, it's about climate change, it's about the environment, it's about international terrorism. All those things cannot be resolved by one nation, big or small, or by a small group of nations. You have to have a global approach. The UN is the best bet. Thank you. Osman, yeah. give your closing remarks. Yeah. And comment first. Yeah, as you, oh, you have my thought. I think, uh, yeah, uh, you know, the UN conference, a uh, budget, budget challenge, and that's very obvious. Because the countries that used to fund the UN, they have their own domestic and economic crisis, so, so, so they will not, they will not pay it. Um, but, but I don't think that is the principal issue. The principal issue with regard to Africa, uh, it has less to do with, uh, with the money itself. Uh, it, has, it has more to do with distribution and redistribution issues, governance issues. Uh, because the resources, the resources in Africa are not properly governed. Uh, you know, 55% of global industrial resources are from Africa. And they are generated through transnational corporations and others. So, so Africa, as I said, is not a, it's not a poor continent. Uh, but it is, it is poorly governed continent. And that is why you have conflict. Uh, the other day there was an article uh, uh, one one uh, oil tycoon from Nigeria, very, very extreme. There are extreme billionaires now in Africa. Actually, one of them can, can, can eliminate poverty in Africa. That is what they said. These are the refugees, and he can, he can feed and others. So, so it is not, I agree with the president, it's not an issue of money. And it is an issue of decisions and, and actually uh, trying to, uh, to, 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 to promote this kind of governance in Africa. But the problem is, we are talking about nation states, but that governance cannot be done within a nation state country. That governance, as you say, the tax evasion and other problems, it needs some kind of global and transnational mechanisms to, to deal with it. So, uh, so uh, in, the, in, in the long term, uh, of course, there are a lot of people who are suffering, uh, but they will not suffer. If uh, I suggest, uh, some of you, you are students, I suggest you to, re to read uh, Amartya Sen, Amartya Sen, uh, freedom and capabilities, and uh, he, he thinks the reason why China and others, they, they have promoted some kind of governance in terms of healthcare and education. And, and so so if, if that thing happens in the coming years in Africa, so there will not be a need to, to, to have a, a financial support from, from outside. Uh, so we need to return to the governance issue. We need to find solutions for that. And that is very complicated now because of the national interest and hegemons and others. So the United Nations has to be reformed in the coming years in terms of 
more civic, civic minded freedom, freedom dimension, and it has to be reformed in terms of not just a few countries dictating what is going on, but it is actually uh, the interest of the people on the ground that has to be to promote it. And then education, uh, the elimination of poverty, gender balance. We need to we need to do these things according to Amar Sen. And, and that is that will probably give us a better work. Uh, it has already given better better work in China, India, these countries. They are actually uh, uh, progressive because they have uh, governance. They have solved the governance issue. And Africa also will do it in the coming years. Thank you, Osman. Christian, would you give a closing remark? Yeah, I agree. Please remark that in the last 15 years, it has been China and India who have been helping the most of reducing the poverty in the world. It's not the Western country or US or Europe. That's thinkable. Why is it so interesting, I think. When I was young, we every year sent more than 2,000 young people out in the world, helping building up uh, small cities, schools, uh, uh, hospitals, and we were proud having the Danish flag on our back when we came around. In these years, we mostly sent uh, some thousand people as soldiers coming out to the countries, living in close areas, have no, no contact to local people. In my youth, the Danish companies were very glad to get these people who came back, had been uh, volunteers working one year or two years or three years in a third world country. They were very important to get into the companies. Today, we have damaged a lot of people who have been soldiers who, and who, who, who get pension when they come back because they have destroyed their brains or their body. I wonder what is the best for Denmark, what is the best for the world. At that time, the 2000 or the 2000 soldiers. Please reflect, because you are the youth who can make the changes. And for me, you have to rise up and say how the day's foreign policy has to be. It's you who decide it, it's not me. I've done it for 40 years now. Now it's your turn. For me, UN is my friend. UN is walking in my shoes. And we have to strengthen you as one of the tools. And please tell me what's the other tools. Thank you very much for the debate. Uh, let, me, let me briefly say thank you for coming. Thank you for the questions. Um, please find us on Facebook, FN for One Moriland. We mostly post in English as well. So we'll make sure to post the articles and even the book that has been mentioned. And if you have any questions, we'll stay around for a little while, and you're welcome to come up and uh, ask us. Thank you. Oh. Just, just one thing, just one thing. See, there's such a great turnout. I just wanted to advertise that on the 10th of May, we will have, uh, we'll have another big gathering, big debate. This time, it will, it will be about migration and national and personal security. We will bring in uh, a number of uh, politicians, we will also have a, a former UN expert, still an expert, former UN person who used to be the assistant High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, who will be the, the main speaker about issues of migration. 10th of uh, May. 10th of May, uh, I forget. It's at it, is, but it, it will be announced. It will be announced. At you want to, and sorry, I have one more comment. Just because you might have discovered there's been a lot of agreement between today's panel on sort of political type issues. We always invite people from other political parties to come here, uh, but naturally we can't force anybody to be here, but just know that we always invite people from the entire political spectrum to be here. So it, in that sense, it's not our fault that there's been a lot of agreement on political issues. I just want to say that. Thank you.